Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'm Phil Levy, Senior Fellow on the Global Economy here at the Council, and we are delighted to welcome Professor Joe Stiglitz to our platform today. Um, as a personal note, I've had the pleasure of learning from Professor Stiglitz for almost three decades now. When I was entering graduate school at Stanford, he was touted as the hottest new addition to the economics faculty there, and he actually lived up to the billing um, in a field that's known for being sharply divided uh, into subfields. He was simultaneously teaching us both mic cutting edge microeconomics and macroeconomics. And with his newest book, he continues to demonstrate his breadth. Uh, after the program, uh, that book, The Euro, How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe, will be available for sale and signing from the bookseller. This afternoon's program is the third event in our Global Economy Series this fall, following earlier sessions with Leo Brainerd and Carmen Reinhardt. We also have a few more exciting events in the series coming up later tonight. Uh, we will welcome Mohamed El Arian, who will discuss how to avoid the next financial collapse. And on December 6th, we will host Sebastian Malaby, speaking about Alan Greenspan's legacy and the lessons for the Federal Reserve. Please note that this afternoon's conversation is on the record, but please silence your phones um, while feeling free to use social media. Today's program will also be live streamed and the video recording will be available online. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. We convene leading global voices, conduct independent research, and engage the public in the discourse on critical global issues. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Now, back to this afternoon's program, I will return to the stage later to moderate the audience Q&A, but I would now like to welcome Dr. Leah Joy Zell to the stage to introduce our, our speaker. Dr. Zell is founder and portfolio manager at Lizard Investors. She is also the vice chairman and treasurer of the Council's board of directors. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Leah Joy Zell. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Leah Zell, as Phil told you. And on behalf of the Council on Global Affairs, I would like to um, uh, welcome you all. Um, I'm pleased this afternoon to introduce Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who is an economist and university professor at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, Professor Stiglitz, previously served as Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank and as Member and Chairman of the U.S. President on, uh, President's Council on Economic Advisors. Um, he is the author of numerous books, including the one he's going to discuss today, the Euro, including Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, an Agenda for Growth and Shared Prosperity, and The Great Divide, Unequal Societies and What We Can Do About Them. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, uh, he is cited as the fourth most influential economist in the world today. Uh, and he also received not only the Johns Bates Clark Medal uh, for outstanding, the outstanding economist under the age of 40, but also the Nobel Prize uh, on economic sciences, which I think trumps them all. Um, uh, Professor Stieglitz is here today to share his views on the future of Europe and the euro, the currency shared by many countries on the continent. In the past few years, Europe has been rocked by several events, the global financial crisis, the ensuing eurozone debt crisis, and of course, more recently, migration, nationalism, and populism. Uh, Brexit seems to have raised additional questions about the viability of the European integration project which is also expected to feature prominently in upcoming elections and political events in Europe, beginning uh, this coming uh, weekend with the referendum in Italy, the presidential election in Austria, and then followed by elections in Netherlands, France, and Germany, amongst other countries. Against this background, uh, the euro now seems to be promoting more discord and economic malaise than binding the countries who share it together. Professor Stiglitz believes that the underlying flaw in the European project was the creation of a single currency prematurely before the institutional architecture was built to support it. Uh, and given this situation, uh, the 
question today is what does the future hold for the euro? Please again join me in welcoming Professor Stiglitz. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back here in, in uh, Chicago area uh, again. Uh, as many of you know, I, I uh, grew up in Gary, Indiana, and I, my mother graduated from the University of Chicago, so, so I have uh, deep roots here. Uh, the, uh, as I say, the subject of this uh, talk is the euro. A natural question uh, is, uh, what is an American doing writing about the euro? Doesn't America have enough problems of its own that we'd have to go across the Atlantic to think about something else to worry about? Uh, well, yes, obviously we do have a lot of problems of our own, uh, but for an economist, uh, the euro is very interesting. We don't have many opportunities for doing experiments, and the euro was a fascinating experiment. Nobody in their right mind would have tried it, uh, but they did, and that gives us a lot of opportunity to see uh, what happened, and, and as we'll see, it, it, it wasn't exactly, uh, uh, hasn't been quite what they, what they expected. But there are other reasons why we should be interested uh, in, in the euro. Um, one of them is because the euro has such a big effect on economic performance in Europe, and Europe is the largest uh, economy in the world, larger or small, slightly smaller than the United States, depending on, on the particular exchange rate. Um, what happens there has a very big effect on the United States. We live in a globally integrated economy, and if a very big part of that global economy is not doing well, it will affect us. Uh, it's also important because uh, in many areas uh, that I'm concerned uh, with, and many others are concerned with, Europe has, has been a, a, at the forefront in areas of climate change, uh, areas of, of human rights. And if they are preoccupied with a uh, failing economy, they won't have enough energy time to devote to dealing with uh, these other, what I view as, as more important problems. So uh, I think there are lots of reasons to be, to be interested uh, in the euro. And finally, um, the euro is an example of a form of economic integration. Uh, a group of countries, uh, 19 of them, are sharing a common currency. goes beyond just a common market, a, co a common trade uh, area like we have with, North, with uh, Canada and Mexico. And uh, it illustrates, to me, very strongly, the consequences of what happens when economic integration uh, gets out of sync with political integration. And that, in a sense, in a nutshell, is, is the key problem. Uh, the euro was a, a political project. Uh, the, the idea was that uh, uh, by uh, creating a common currency that would be shared uh, by these countries, uh, it would uh, facilitate uh, uh, econo uh, further eco economic and political integration. So in other words, um, it was a political project that using economics as an instrument in the hope that this greater economic integration would lead to prosperity that would in turn lead to greater uh, uh, political solidarity and that in turn would lead to furthering the political intent of greater political integration. Uh, so they hoped that they were creating a, a virtuous cycle in a sense between economics and politics. But in fact, at the moment in 1992, when the euro was created, uh, a convention in Maastricht, uh, the politics wasn't strong enough to create all the institutions that were necessary to make the single market work, work well. Uh, they knew that, but the hope was that somehow over the succeeding period of time, uh, the, the, 
that these deficiencies would be repaired. And the result of it was the euro would work. But of course, when nothing happened, when, when, when things were seemingly going well, uh, there were no further reforms. And then when the crisis finally happened in 2008 and 2010, uh, it, it turned out that, that they started to make some changes, but they simply were not fast enough or deep enough. And the result of it is that the flaws in the construction of the euro became more and more apparent. So what I want to do uh, uh, this afternoon is to try to describe some of these flaws and describe what could be done about it and give a little bit of sense of what is likely to be done about it. Um, the, uh, to understand uh, the, the structure of the euro, what was done, one has to put this at the particular moment in history when the euro was created, as I said, 1992, which was right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of communism. It was a moment of euphoria for market economies. We thought, or many people thought, it was the triumph of capitalism, when in fact it was really the failure of a system that couldn't work. It was a, a failure of, of, of communism that, that was a flawed economic system and a flawed political system. Uh, that was important because the lesson they took from that is a overconfidence in market uh, economies. So they thought if they just make sure that the government didn't get in the way, the market would take care of the rest. So the structure, the construction of the euro, they paid a lot of attention to constraining government in the belief, as I say, that once you did that, the market would take care of the rest. So at the core of the, of the, of the, of the euro, were three ideas that if only gov government limited the deficits to 3% of GDP, limited debts to 60% of de uh, GDP, limited inflation to 2% uh, annually, then the countries would come together, the system would work, and there would be prosperity. You might ask, where did those three numbers come from? And the answer is they pulled them out of the thin air. <laughs> there was no scientific basis for these numbers at all. And uh, it's so interesting because when I talk to European audiences who've grown up believing in these numbers, you know, 2%, 3%, 60%, it's part of their, it's like their constitution. They, they you know, they, they can recite these in their, in their sleep. And, they, they, and then you tell them, these numbers were pulled out of thin air, and it's sort of like telling them, you know, our, our, these are articles of our religion, you're telling, telling me that, that it doesn't have a scientific basis? And the answer is, no, it doesn't have a scientific basis. In fact, some of you may know that, that um, you mentioned you, uh, 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 Carmen Reinhardt was here. Well, uh, uh, her co uh, she and uh, co-author Ken Rogoff wrote a very famous paper uh, 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 a number of years ago, in which they argued it wasn't 60 percent, but there was a magic number around 80 or 90 percent. If deficit, if debt, debt GDP ratio got above that, then growth would slow down. So that was the basis. A lot of people started saying we ought to be worried about debt getting too large. But then I always give this example because uh, it's a wonderful example. Uh, 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 a, a graduate student said, "This is uh, this is not plausible. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. After all, we know the United States ended World War II with a debt GDP ratio of 135 percent, and we it was the period of our fastest economic growth." We knew that UK ended the World War II with a debt GDP ratio of 220%. And it was a, after they got over the immediate aftermath, it was a period of rapid economic growth. Um, so, and I'll come back to what, what the lesson of that is in a second. But anyway, the story, the graduate student is, he asked for the data and 
They didn't give it, and he asked the data. He, finally, they got the data, and the graduate student looked at it and discovered right away that there was a spreadsheet mistake and redid the stuff, data. And it turned out it was totally wrong. And that there was no, no magic number of 80, 90%. And that they would actually messed up all the kind of metrics. They hadn't gotten statistical significance. They hadn't gotten causality right. It was really, it was an embarrassing piece of uh, uh, published research. Uh, they don't think so, but um, <laughs> I do. And, and, and I think there, there, there's a general consensus uh, about that. So, but that just, I just want to reiterate these numbers 3% deficit, 60% uh, debt had no basis in, in economic uh, research. To come back to the, the particular number, because I'm going to, a uh, particular aspect, because I'm going to come back to, it's, it's an important thing both for the United States and for what happened in Europe. Uh, how did the United States uh, deal with that 135% debt GDP ratio? And how is the European policymakers dealing with it when they see numbers like 110% debt GDP ratio in Greece, which is what happened in 2010. Well, what Europe did is to say, well, we can't spend money, we have to have austerity, we have to cut back. And what has been the effect in Greece and the other countries when they've done that? Well, the economy has contracted GDP has gotten smaller, and the debt-GDP ratio has gone up. So that today in Greece, they've gone from 110% debt-GDP ratio to close to 200% after a debt restructuring. The United States took what I view as the right course, and what we did is we said, the way we'll get, deal with the problem is to grow out of it. And so what we did is we kept our interest rates low, um, and uh, we went through the fastest period of our growth. It was a shared prosperity where every part of our economy grew, every, every segment of our population. But those at the bottom grew more than those at the top. Uh, we had a period of heavy investment in education, uh, technology, roads, infrastructure, across the board. And the result of it was 15 years later, our debt GDP ratio went from 135 down to about 45% of debt GDP ratio. So it's the right, it was the right solution. And, and that is, is in one of the big morals of, of, this, uh, of this story. Um, so uh, what, what, did, uh, what did Europe do? Uh, it was found in this particular period, the euro was found in this particular period of the faith in the market economy, and so they just focused on these constraints on government. If it had been founded a few years later, ideas might have been very, very different. For instance, five years later, 1997-98, we had the East Asia crisis, a crisis in these countries of East Asia where the governments had low debts, low debt, and low inflation, and yet they had a major crisis. And then we know in 2008, the United States had a major crisis originating from the private sector. So had, they been, had, it, had the euro been founded a little bit later, there would have been a more balanced economic structure that would have been aware that you can have problems from, from the government side, but you can also have problems from the private side. It would, have, it would have been a more balanced structure. They didn't have that balance, and that lack of balance is really the source, the key source of the problem. So the main thesis of this book is you hear a lot about complaints uh, of uh, Germany and other countries about the structure of the individual countries, about Greece, about uh, Italy, about uh, Spain. Uh, the real problem of Europe is the structure of the Eurozone itself. And I'll try to explain what are the reforms in the Eurozone uh, that uh, are necessary. But before getting there, I want to, to show how badly the Eurozone has been performing. 
Because remember, it was supposed to bring, bring prosperity, and that would bring more political solidarity, and that would reinforce uh, the European project. What's happened is it's brought stagnation, and that has brought political divisiveness. And so the divides within Europe are greater than they've ever been. Um, the economic divides as well as the political divides. So um, th th this first, I'll go through a few charts just very quickly to give you a brief picture of, of how bad things are. Uh, GDP in two th by the end of last year was just reaching the level that it was uh, in 2000, before the crisis. So uh, the point is that they've been facing close to a decade of stagnation for the Eurozone as a whole, a lost decade. And the real fear is that can, it, it may turn into, for many of the countries, into a lost quarter century. Uh, that's the average, what I just described. And of course, for some of the countries, GDP is still much lower than it was before the crisis. Um, and this shows the magnitude of the decline, particularly in, uh, in Greece, the average decline, average rate of decline was more than 3%. For many of these countries, the countries uh, uh, that are described in the periphery, Italy, uh, 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 Spain, Portugal, uh, Finland, even uh, a nor good northern European country, um, the downturn was worse than the Great Depression. So we think of the Great Depression as being bad. We have to remember the, what Europe has experienced since 2007 has been worse than the Great Depression. And uh, this is just another uh, uh, little uh, chart that illustrates uh, this is in terms of rate of growth per member of the working age population, which is a, a good way of seeing what's going on. Uh, Japan is doing better than the United States, but much worse than either of them is the Euro area. Probably more disturbing for society is the fact that they have such a high unemployment rate. Uh, the unemployment rate, remember, in the United States reached what we thought a terrible 10%, and then we brought it down. Well, the average for the euro area was 12%, and it's just now getting down to 10%. But much worse is the problem of youth unemployment. Uh, I should say on, on this, on the previous thing, there are, if you look at, at particular countries, um, you know, uh, we were just in a, a discussion at the University of Chicago, uh, uh, and uh, one of the panelists is saying, look at, you know, uh, Spain has reformed. It's really doing well. And I happen to point out, well, yeah, it's doing well. The unemployment has just gotten down to 19%. <laughs> and youth unemployment has just broken below 50%. Uh, that's not exactly a mark of success in my book. Uh, the, the youth unemployment rate, as I say, is, has been roughly twice that uh, of uh, other countries. Youth unemployment in Greece uh, was over 60% at one point. It's gone down to a little under 50% now, but only because all the talented young people have left the country. And that's not, you know, families don't like that. Uh, uh, you know, one thing, uh, and those who, who, who don't leave the country are living at home, and we all love to see our children, but not when they're in the mid-30s. Uh, and uh, so this has become a way of life uh, throughout uh, th these countries. Um, and it's really devastating, uh, these countries. It means that their growth for, decades, for years into the future is going to be weaker than it otherwise uh, would have been. Um, well, uh, one of the countries that is uh, said to be doing better is, is Germany. 
But Germany is doing well only by comparison with the countries surrounding it, which are doing much worse. In other words, if you looked at the growth rate of Germany, you would say, under normal terms, it would get a D or D minus. And it's particularly bad because the bottom third of the population have really not been doing very well at all. But even more uh, disturbing is the growth that they've had has been based on a peculiar economic model of having very high trade surpluses, exporting a lot more than they're importing. I don't know if you remember uh, before, 2000, before the crisis of 2008, we all talked about China's huge trade imbalances and that there would be a disorderly unwinding and that these trade surpluses were unfair to the rest of the world, were putting a, a problem um, uh, on the rest of the world. Um, well, without realizing what's going on, uh, what's happened is that Germany now has much larger trade surpluses than China. The real source of trade imbalances in the world today are Germany and Northern Europe more broadly. And so what you see here is uh, relative to their GDP now, uh, Germany's uh, trade surpluses are almost twice that of, uh, uh, of China's. And that means that it is imposing costs on uh, other countries, including uh, on its neighbors uh, within, uh, the Euro within the Eurozone. Uh, so let me switch now and try to, to describe uh, what the, the basic economics, why it is, hasn't worked, uh, or and why it's worked so poorly. The basic thing is when you share a common currency, you take away two of the most important adjustment mechanisms when you're hit by a shock. And they were unfortunate. They were hit by a very big shock, the global financial crisis starting from uh, the United States. Um, uh, the, uh, what, the two most important instruments that you have is to lower interest rates and to lower your exchange rates. And by lowering interest rates and lowering exchange rates, you make your economy uh, more competitive. Uh, but when they joined the euro together, it meant that the individual countries couldn't lower their exchange rate, they couldn't lower their own interest rate, and therefore they couldn't give their own economy a boost. But it was even worse than that. They took away these two critical elements of adjustment, but then they tied their hand even more. They tied their hand even more by saying you can't use the other important instrument, which is fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is important to stimulate your economy when you don't have monetary policy or exchange rate policy. But they said you could only have a 3% deficit to GDP ratio. So this meant that having taken away all the instruments of adjustment, they were in effect condemned to have a much deeper economic downturn. So you might have thought that the crisis, having originated in the United States, would be much worse in the United States. But what you can see is that the uh, uh, United States has recovered, not greatly. It's still uh, on the right-hand side of that panel. You can see the United States. The red line is the, gro uh, is the projected growth of where, uh, you know, uh, tracing our growth from 1980 through uh, 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 around 2000 and then extending it on, what you see is fairly steady growth. And then you have the crisis of 2008. We did very poorly. The green line is what we actually did. And you see it opening up of the gap between the red line and the green line. But we're finally growing. The numbers that came out showed that uh, last, uh, just uh, yesterday showed we're growing about, a little over 3% this quarter. Um, but on the left-hand side of that screen, you see the euro area, where there are two things to notice about that graph. First, with the beginning of the euro in the year 1999, you don't see any gro growth spurt that was hoped for. There wasn't any for the euro as a whole. Some countries did better and other countries did worse. There was not any growth spurt. 
But what you really see is that beginning in 2008 with the crisis, the North Atlantic crisis, their economy really hit a dead end, and they really haven't recovered since then. And so that gap between where they would have been and where they are today has uh, opened up wider and wider. It's not only um, that there's this gap that's been opening up wider and wider, but the rich countries have been doing better and the poor countries more poorly. So the gap between the rich and the poor has been widening. They thought they had created a economic structure that would lead to convergence. In fact, they called the 3%, 60% numbers convergence criteria. But there was no economic theory that would said that this would lead to convergence. And if you looked at the structure of the Eurozone, it became clear that they had actually created a set of economic arrangements that would lead to divergence. Let me explain a couple of the elements of, of that divergence. Uh, one element uh, that's easiest to see has to do with capital uh, movements. Uh, think about what happened uh, in the United States uh, in the world economy uh, after 2008. Uh, we had a major financial crisis. Uh, we, uh, after that financial crisis, you would have thought, uh, a global financial crisis that started in the United States, you would have thought that money would have left the United States because that was clearly a country that had not managed itself well. But what actually happened globally? Money came into the United States. And you have to ask why. Was it because our banks had proven that they knew how to manage risks well? <laughs> yeah, that was a rhetorical question. And obviously, they had not. Uh, why? Well, it was actually very easy. Uh, I was on a, 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 it was because uh, our government said it was able and willing to stand behind our banks, behind our economy. So if you brought money and put it in our banks, we would stand behind it. In fact, at that point, we had unlimited deposit insurance. I, I remember I was in a conference call right after Lehman Brothers collapsed with, with, with Obama, and the question was, what would be the democratic response to uh, uh, the proposed uh, $700 billion bailout of uh, our banking system? And most of the people on the conference call were bankers, as you could imagine. Uh, and their question was, the first question is, was, I, 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 if I, this was my students, I'd say, what, what do you think the question was? Well, the question was, why only $700 billion? <laughs> and the answer was, a trillion sounded too big. <laughs> but don't worry, if you need more, there's more there. Well, why was that important? It was important because it meant that people could put their money here in the United States and, and they wouldn't lose it. Well, Behind this, in other words, was that we had, we were insuring our banks, our financial system. Well, in Europe, uh, when Spain has a problem, who has to bail out the Spanish banks? Who's going to provide money to help somebody who's put their money in a Spanish bank? It's the Spanish government. But do you have much confidence, or should you have much confidence in, in 2010, 11, in the Spanish government? Or would you take your money and put your money in Germany? Remember, it's all in euros, and it's easy to move money across Europe in principle. And obviously, the answer is that people took their money out of the Spanish banks and moved it into Germany. What did that mean? It meant that there were Spanish banks had less money, they could lend less, less, and that meant there was contraction, what I call private austerity. So there was less investment in the country, the country's economy went down, and that meant less tax revenue and even less money to back up the financial system. 
So it was a downward vicious circle. So, um, and then, remember I talked about the constraint that were put on the governments that they couldn't spend more than, have a deficit more than 3% of GDP. We had a deficit that was far more than 3% of the GDP in the midst of our crisis. So they had public austerity, they had private austerity, and no wonder then that the countries like Spain started going down. And it was a vicious cir downward circle. So the richer countries got richer and the poorer countries got poorer. And so that began this process uh, of divergence within Europe. And there were several other factors, the design uh, that contributed to that. Uh, as the weaker countries got weaker, the most talented people would leave the country. And that meant the burden of debt that was left on behind. Remember, when you leave a country, you don't take away, you don't, move with you your share of the national debt. You leave that behind. So it's a peculiar kind of debt. It's a kind of debt that you owe only if you stay in the country. So young Greek people said, why should I pay back the mistakes of my parents? Or in the case of Ireland, it was even worse. Because the debt was a result of the European Central Bank insisting in a private secret letter that the government bail out the banks for uh, lending that was connected lending that was uh, part of the, uh, the political regime. So the, the, the European Central Bank insisted on a government bailout when Ireland said, no, we shouldn't bail out the banks. We, they made the mistake and we shouldn't uh, bear the cost. So there, there's even a stronger argument. Uh, it was Europe itself that forced this debt on them. So it's easy for them to move to London, or it used to be easy, uh, to move elsewhere in Europe to, uh, in, within Eurozone to escape the burden of the debt. So these are all ways in which the, the system that they created in Europe Europe led to uh, this increasing uh, divergence between the richer countries and the poorer countries. Well, um, there are many other aspects uh, that, that of, of the, the failure of the Eurozone that I can talk about. Just two I want to mention just very briefly. One of them has to do with, uh, both of them have to do with how you handled uh, the, the crisis countries, countries like Greece, Spain, uh, and Portugal. Uh, there were two aspects of their, of their responses. One was macroeconomics, this extreme austerity. Um, this extreme austerity where they, they, they actually insisted on the countries uh, having what is called a primary surplus, that is to say a surplus uh, not taking into account what you owe on your debt. Um, of in the case of Greece, they they, they originally they said uh, your surplus had to be uh, moved towards six percent of GDP. No country has ever achieved that. Um, they are still insisting that they move to three and a half percent of GDP. The idea that a country have a surplus means that it has to have revenues uh, more than expending. Spending within the country is constrained. And when spending in the country is constrained, the economy goes down. It was worries about this kind of surplus that is necessary to service a debt that motivated uh, Kings to criticize the Treaty of Versailles. Um, where uh, there were the reparations that were imposed on Germany, and Cain said these reparations will cause Germany to go into a depression. Now, Germany managed to forestall that because it got loans from the United States until the Great Depression. And when those loans stopped, Germany went into the Great Depression. So what was the basis of Germany's Great Depression? It was really this primary surplus, exactly the primary surplus that is now demanding that Greece have. 
And what's happened to Greece? This depression that is worse than the Great Depression. In 2015, they had a, um, uh, a referendum. 62% of the people in Greece said, we want to end austerity. And the Eurozone responded saying, uh, you gave up your economic sovereignty when you joined the Euro. And they might say, well, when do we have a discussion of that? And they say, you never did. Uh, it just happened. Uh, the only countries where they actually had a discussion and put it to a referendum whether they would join the Euro uh, were Denmark and Sweden, and both of those countries rejected it. So uh, that was why the others didn't like the idea of putting it to a referendum. Uh, but even in those countries, there was not as much attention paid to the consequences of giving up your democratic sovereignty over your economy uh, that there should have been. Uh, so what happened after all, all with the, 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 the uh, 2015, uh, uh, the Greeks felt very strongly they wanted to stay part of the Euro, and the Euro said, uh, Eurozone said, uh, you have a choice, you either have to accept austerity or leave the euro and exclude a bit like uh, you know you uh, people you, you, you have children and you say you either have to have a or b and the answer is i want a and b and uh greek said greece said we want the end austerity and we want to stay in the euro and euro would say no you have to have either one or the other and they would say no you either have to have one or the other and finally greece said, okay, we, we feel so important that we stay in the euro, people were actually crying, they want to stay in the euro, that they accepted the, uh, another dose of austerity. And what has happened since then? The depression has continued without end. And uh, that's why I think uh, it's very likely that there will be uh, another crisis in Greece if there isn't a, a a crisis in Italy before that. Um, the, what I wanted to show here is uh, the Troika, that's the uh, European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the IMF, have made forecasts of what was going to happen with their policies. And what was remarkable is they kept saying, recoveries around the corner. <laughs> You know, every, every, every six months, they say recovery's around the corner. And you can see what happened is uh, uh, the black line is where they kept projecting output be, uh, to be, and what you see is the bottom line is where the actual output is. And you can see the now the huge gap between where they thought Greece was going to be and uh, where, where it actually is. Um, and, and as I say, they, they, they make these models over and over again every six months, and the gap is, is still there. So that's the, that's the macroeconomic uh, policies, which have been very flawed. The structural policies that they've imposed on the individual countries uh, have been uh, equally bad, or even worse in some ways. And uh, I... I um, it's hard to explain these structural policies because they're very hard to explain. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're very peculiar. So uh, the, the, they, the, the, in my book, I describe some of them. I think the most amusing one or the mo uh, is uh, you have to have this picture of Greece going into this Great Depression, GDP going down 25%, youth unemployment at 63%. Uh, and um, they're discussing, the Troika is discussing the issue of the definition of fresh milk. And uh, the... the uh, Greece had a definition that milk that was older than four days was not fresh. And the Troika decided that that 
was really ruining this cause of the entire Greek economy's problem was for that four-day definition. And so they made an enormous push to change that to 10 days, which one of my Italian colleagues says, that's yogurt, that's not milk. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, and they won. And it, it hasn't solved Greece's problem to have a, a change of the definition of fresh milk to 10 days. Uh, you might ask, what was that about? And, and I've gotten, heard various stories. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one that some people deny, but I, I it has some, uh, 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 I find it a little bit persuasive. The Dutch, large Dutch uh, milk exporters wanted to sell their milk into Greece. And it takes a while to ship your milk from from Netherlands down to Greece, and they wanted to sell their old milk as fresh milk. So, so uh, they that that if they change the definition, then Dutch milk could be called fresh milk, putting poor Greek people out of jobs, worsening the balance of payments of Greece, actually making Greece's problems worse, but making Dutch dairy farmers happier, and that. Yes, that there may have been another aspect of their economic agenda. So wh where does this leave us? Well, um, to me, uh, there are only two ways uh, forward uh, for Europe. Uh, the current halfway house is not sustainable. They either have to have, you might say, more Europe or less Europe. And in the book, then I try to describe what I mean by both of these. More Europe... Uh, would be to put into place some of the institutions that would make a common currency work. We have we share a common currency among 50 fairly diverse states. They're not quite as diverse as Europe. We share a common currency, and uh, you can ask, well, what do we have that they don't have, and uh, which of those things are really, really necessary? So one thing, the example I gave sort of illustrates, one of the things, that, uh, a couple of things that were really important that were brought out uh, in, in our crisis were the importance of having a um, common uh, deposit insurance system and a common bank resolution. So remember I said one of the reasons that money was leaving Spain is that there's not common deposit insurance. Insurance on your deposit in Spain is provided by the Spanish government, and what's that worth? So, the the uh, if you you need to have a European-wide insurance system, we have that through the Federal Deposit Insurance. Uh, um, you also have a common resolution. When a bank has a problem, it has to be the problems have to be addressed by Europe, European-wide. So think about what would have happened in our crisis in 2008 if, if the state of Washington had had to deal with the problems, bail out Washington Mutual, one of our biggest bank failures. Well, if that had had to happen, Washington State would also be like Greece. <laughs> It'd be in a serious problem. But it wasn't the state of Washington that bailed out Washington Mutual. It was... Again, the federal government that bailed, that bailed it out. So this common banking system, which we began to construct in 1863, and then deposit insurance in, in the Great Depression, is a, is a, is a central part. Uh, another important area is something called euro bonds. Uh, one of the things that Europe did is create unintentionally a kind of problem that I confronted when I was chief economist uh, of the World Bank all the time. When countries borrow in a currency that is not under their control, it can give rise to very serious problems because they may not have, you know, you borrow in dollars, you may not have dollars to repay. The United States, even though S&P doesn't understand this, the United States will never default on its bonds. Why? Yeah, we pay, we'll, we will pay the, when we write a government bond, we pay back, we promise to pay back dollars. And who controls the printing presses? 
We do. So only if there's a, a problem in electricity or something like that, <laughs> that we would not repay. So um, it's almost inconceivable that we would not repay. Although, uh, um, but uh, in the East Asia crisis, we saw all the time that countries did not have enough dollars to repay what they owed. Well, Greece can't repay the euros because it doesn't control the printing presses. So that means if it's going to work, the borrowing has to be done at the European level, and that's called a euro bond. And there are various ways institutionally of doing that, but again, it's one of those uh, necessary things. Finally, a third example of what is important is when we go into a recession, a deep recession uh, like we had, California unemployment rate may go up. Who pays for the extra unemployment insurance? The federal, it's paid for nationally. But that's not true in the case of Europe. And that means the country that is weak has to pay for the unemployment insurance. That means that it's weaker, can't invest in infrastructure, can't invest in education, it gets weaker and weaker. So the bottom line of all of this is that there are a set of reforms in the structure of the Eurozone that would be easy to do economically, but are beyond the politics of Europe today. The other alternative is to an amicable divorce, some way of introducing more flexibility, and I describe in the book several ways in which uh, that can be done. Uh, it will be traumatic, but one has to remember the current system is very traumatic. Uh, the lack of growth that I depicted uh, here uh, illustrates uh, that uh, it's, it's already uh, traumatic, and the high youth unemployment illustrates that it's traumatic. So what's the forecast? Unfortunately, neither of these two are likely to happen. Uh, more likely is the current muddling through, which means going from crisis to crisis, brinkmanship, and until the danger of brinkmanship is that eventually you go over the brink, uh, and the crisis is bigger than they can handle. And when that will happen or how it will happen is hard to predict. But what is clear is that as they've constituted it, the current system uh, will be it's very difficult to get it to work. And unless they make those reforms, they're going to be preoccupied with moving from crisis to crisis and slow economic growth, which means they won't be able to deal with the much more important problems that they ought to be dealing with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We're going to go to audience questions in just a second, so start warming up. I thought I would abuse my position and ask the first question, which is um, if there's a, perhaps a single area that's sort of preeminent where you've, among your many contributions to economics, it's about information economics. And often in other tellings of the European crisis, people focus on some of this, especially moral hazard. So you take an issue like the euro bonds. If I say, here's a joint credit card, go out and do things, you actually, I think, taught me these stories. Um, <laughs> but you, you take this. I, I have some difficulties because you may not go to the same shopping expedition that you were otherwise inclined to do. Um, and some would argue that that was sort of what Greece did since they didn't really stick to those 3%, 60%, but rather acted as if they had a European guarantee. It turns out it wasn't as good a guarantee as they thought. What do you see as the problem? How do you address issues of moral hazard? And then I'm going to yeah. come to the audience. So so that illustrates one of, one of the huge uh, divides. Uh, People in Germany really worry about this moral hazard issue, that, and they see that in absolutely every institutional reform. You say common deposit insurance, they say, well, somebody's going to, to, to uh, engage in excessively risky behavior, and then we'll have to bail them out. So every aspect of risk sharing, there's always a risk of moral hazard. Well, the, uh, the answer to that is you need to have supervision. Uh, the reason we, we have common deposit insurance in the United States, and how do we mitigate against the risk? We don't do it perfectly, as we saw in 2008, but we have a system of, of bank supervision and bank regulation, precisely because we worry that in the absence of that, people might take too much risk and get deposits 
at a low interest rate and then undertake excessively risky activities. So we know that when you provide insurance, you do have to monitor and supervise. But it's not that, I mean, it, I don't want to say it's, it's, uh, you can't do it perfectly, but the cost of, you know, if you want to have a share, a common currency, and you want to have free capital flows, my answer is you have to have these deposit insurance. You have to create these institutions. And then you have to mitigate the risk through supervision and regulation. And if you think you can't do it, then don't have a common market. Don't have a common currency. I mean, it's really that simple. You, you can't have a currency system that works when there's not enough trust and not enough of the other institutions that go with it. Thank you. All right, let me invite questions from the audience. Um, I'll ask you to wait for the microphone. We'll start right here. Wait for the microphone. Please identify yourselves. And if it is a statement, please put it in the form of a question. <laughs> Don Cox, if we go back before all the troubles, uh, basically, um, Henry Kissinger said that you can't, they can't make this work when you've got no comparative advantages among all the nations. So when you put them in competing with each other without any tariffs, that Germany and the strong nations are going to continue to gain market share right across it, and the weaker countries uh, are going to get weaker, uh, and you can't repeal the law of comparative advantages just by simply saying you've got a common currency. So that uh, the, the crisis uh, then, you're, you've been talking about how it is you have to deal in a crisis. You presented that brilliantly. But the basic economic model surely was wrong. Well, uh, the uh, uh, let me just say uh, there, there are three, a couple parts of your questions. The 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 issue about when can a set of countries uh, share a common currency was actually addressed by a really uh, influential uh, paper uh, by a colleague of mine at Columbia, uh, Bob Mundell. Uh, who got a Nobel Prize for his work. And some people joke that now that Europe has failed, maybe they should take the prize back. But he actually, he actually explained why it was so difficult for uh, uh, the Eurozone to work uh, in his paper. Uh, and uh, he underestimated the difficulties because his model was overly uh, simplistic. Uh, the aspect that they focused on in particular was the ability to handle shocks, and that's what I talked about, cyclical shocks like the 2008 crisis. But there is a, 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 uh, another problem that you uh, referred to, which I think is also very important, didn't get as much attention, which is what happens if one country's productivity growth was much greater than that of another, and that normally you can adjust for that change in productivity growth by just adjusting the exchange rate. And uh, you took away that flexibility. Um, there, there are, uh, are a couple of answers to that. You know, one of the things that Europe, uh, again, mistake that they made is one of the things you could have done is to say what they need is more uh, industrial policies. You need policies to help the countries that are growing their productivity more slowly to enhance their productivity growth. There's no, you know, they usually need you know, more help in R&D and technology and, and you try to help them. But actually one of the strange things within the Euro, EU as a whole, is they have restrictions on the use of industrial policy. So they made it even more difficult for the countries that were lagging to catch up. Uh, so they put impediments in the way of this. Now, there's another way of dealing with it, which is to, and this is really uh, part of the, uh, there's another way of adjusting real exchange rate. You see, when you fix the exchange rate, you fix the nominal exchange rate, but you can still change the real exchange rate either by having prices in the more productive country go up or the prices in the less productive country go down. Uh, and so you either have inflation in Germany or deflation in Italy. But deflation is really hard because people owe money in euros, and when you deflate, their income is going down, the value of what they owe uh, is going up, uh, leverage is going up. 
Um, and so it's much easier to have the country that is stronger have its prices and wages go up. But Germany's refused. It's insisted that all the adjustment be done by the weaker countries. So just the countries that are weaker are being forced to bear the entire burden of adjustment. And that's another reason for uh, why Europe is not working very well. Um, let's go right over here, please, to the third row. Wait for the microphone for one second. There will be. I'm loud enough. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you see Brexit uh, you know, unfolding, if, if they unfold today? Uh, okay, yeah. So some people are still saying uh, Brexit may not actually happen. Uh, and the prime minister says Brexit means Brexit, uh, but that may not mean Brexit. So, so, so no one really fully knows, and there are lots of scenarios about how it might not happen. Uh, I, I think there are, uh, uh, to me, and, and in the in the uh, English version, I, I managed. I managed in the in the English version of the book it, to actually add a, a chapter on on Brexit. Uh, my my, my uh, English publisher had a gun to my head, and I, and they they got it out in uh, three weeks. So so I uh, so uh, to me the political consequences of Brexit are much greater than the economic consequences. Uh, the tariffs between. Uh, if they if they went back to WTO tariffs, that is to say, let's treat you know if UK and Europe said okay, we're not going to give you any special treatment other than what we give to other WTO members, the tariffs would go up about five percent on goods. But the devaluation, the fall in the value of the pound, has been about fifteen percent. So, and that just shows you the power of exchange rate adjustment. So it has been far outweigh, the adjustment in the exchange rate has far outweighed the consequences of the tariffs, which is one of the reasons why the UK growth is actually doing very well. The service sector is a little bit more complicated, especially, um, you know, London is always engaged, is, a, is, a, is, is one of the, uh, main onshore, offshore, bad uh, financial centers uh, where they do some things that they probably shouldn't be doing. Um, and they want to continue doing that. And Europe is not likely to allow them to do that now that they've left. But that's, to me, you know, if I were uh, UK, I would say, well, that's probably a good thing. Maybe more people would actually get down to real work. So, so uh, that... Uh, but there are some of the problems in, in the service sector. The politics is, is more, more difficult because it may be beginning a, a process of the fraying of the European project. And um, that, I think, will have long-term uh, uh, economic and even more political consequences. Thank you. Um, let's go right here. Can I, can I just make one more comment about, you know, I, th I do... There's a link between the Brexit and, and, and what I write about in the book, because one of the reasons that uh, for the no vote, only one, there are a lot of bad reasons, but one of the reasons was they looked across the channel and they saw a large fraction of Europe not working very well. The Eurozone was not working very well. And they saw the peculiar things, you know, like the, the milk story. I, and they say, do we want to be a member of this club? And so the, the failures in the Eurozone did have, I think, some political consequences uh, on the uh, Brexit vote. Thank you. Uh, why is the Euro worth saving? If you can just uh, establish some sort of a free trade zone where there's minimal tariffs um, and people went back to their, uh, their sovereign uh, currencies, you'd restore the exchange rate flexibility and the interest rate flexibility. Um, so other than just the friction of uh, exchange rate conversion, um, why is the uh, euro worth saving? You must have read my book. Uh, <laughs> no, I, what I say in the book is, you know, it's just money. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's just a currency. Uh, the euro was a means to an end, 
not an end in itself. And the real problem is it's become an end in itself. And there is this enormous emotional attachment to the euro. You know, as I, you know when I, was, I described when I was in Greece how people were crying about the possibility they leave the euro. And you try to explain to them it's just a currency. And you'll get back your own currency, and it'll be look just as shiny, and you'll, you, you know, you can get attached to it too. Uh, there is a, they saw it as being European, but I think it's far more important for them to focus on on the common real values that constitute the European project, and not on on money. So, so I agree, very much agree with you. May I ask a follow-up on that one? Can you imagine or paint a picture of an orderly transition back? I mean, when you have, so what some people have noted is, it, it may have been a very poor idea, as you stated at the beginning, to even try this, but perhaps we have history, so history matters here. You've got contracts now written exclusively in euros without contingencies for things. Is there a sort of clear idea of how you get there from here? Yeah, so it's not costless to go back in time. And t time does have a one direction. So, so if everything were working well, you would say, okay, it may not have been the best of idea, but it's not the worst of ideas and we can live with it. But it's working actually, I think, very badly. So then the question is, what is the cost of leaving versus the benefit of leaving? Um, and then that brings to the question of how do you minimize the cost of leaving? And that's why I have one of the chapters that I describe, I call it an amicable divorce. Uh, uh, one of the key, uh, so, so uh, one of the arguments I, I try to put forward is, is creating a, a electronic currency, a cashless economy. Well, interesting, uh, Ken Rogoff's new book is about also a cashless economy. There's a real uh, movement now to thinking about, so if you didn't need you trust this book more than the last one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, having a, a, a there, if you have electronic currency, it's easy to move from one currency system to another. It would be a lot easier, and I try to explain how that is. Most of our countries are mostly towards a cashless economy already. We Most of our transactions are done digitally. So it's not that far of a stretch to go uh, the rest of the way. So that's part of the mechanism of, of moving. Um, the hardest part is, and, uh, is dealing with um, uh, debt, uh, the debts and restructuring the debt. Argentina had a, uh, was highly dollarized, it had its currency linked to the dollar when it um, devalued the currency in 2001-2. And uh, it had the fastest period of its economic growth. In fact, it was the second fastest growing economy in the world uh, after China until the great economic recession. And while the first few years were a catch up from the recession, after that it was still, you know, basically taking advantage of, of the stimulus of the of the low exchange rate. And so um, it's not costless and you have to pay attention and they did a lot of attention to debt how you do debt restructuring. Uh, but I think as I say, I think that that, that can be done. Yeah, thank you. Um, do a question back here, please, along the aisle. Do you pay attention to the circumstances in your hometown of Gary? And if you do, uh, how do you see its future? Uh, yes, I do. Not, not, not on a, a, a um, you know, day by day or even year by year basis. But I did go back, uh, I, I did a film uh, a few years ago uh, on globalization and it begins in Gary. So I went back and, and they actually were, were uh, a, a, the story of the film is actually interesting because they, they have a, a department in the city that uh, is mayor's office because they make films in Gary because it, 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 it turns out it's a good place for locating films it, like in war zones like Somali, it's a little safer than Somali. Uh, not 
maybe about roughly the same as South Side of Chicago, but uh, but you had the same feeling of devastation. Uh, uh, Gary and Detroit are competing, but but uh, you get you get that. Uh, um, this is an example of, I think, a, a failure to deal with the structural transformation of our economy and to deal with deindustrialization that began, you know, 35 years ago and to believe that the market would just take care of it. And it clearly didn't. Didn't do it in Gary, didn't do it in Detroit. Um, and um, combined with an overlay of racial problems, um, um, and uh, it seems to me that uh, yeah, it, it, it sort of typifies the uh, uh, a failure uh, in this uh, important area of urban development uh, or redevelopment. And you can see uh, in, in some in some places in Europe, they've actually handled this particular problem better. Uh, there are areas like Manchester. Uh, that have reconstructed themselves from uh, 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 textile. They can't compete with China anymore, and they've reconstructed themselves into a, uh, a very different kind of city using their resources into an education, cultural uh, city. So it does uh, illustrate uh, one of the issues that I talk a little bit about, which is industrial policy uh, that I mentioned just a minute ago. Let's see. A question right here. To transition from your 2012 book on inequality to the speech today, what do you see as the common um, uh, drivers of inequality, economic inequality between the United States and the European bloc? And then are there any ones that are different, uh, different drivers between the two regions? Yeah, I think there are a lot of common uh, drivers uh, with the big difference is that um, they don't do things quite to the same extreme, and they have done a lot of things to try to mitigate the growth of before market income inequality and to do even more to mitigate after market income inequality. So let me just uh, illustrate uh, uh, these. So, so for instance, uh, some of the global forces of deindustrialization are going on. Uh, I gave the just example of, of they've had a more active policy of combating the consequence of deindustrialization. Very hard to stop it, but they've combated it. In the case of, of Germany, they've had a more proactive policy of trying to fit, find a niche in the industrial structure in which they can fit. And uh, the same thing in Northern Italy. And they've done actually pr pretty well in both of those uh, uh, places. Um, the uh, education system, which is one of the main mechanisms for the intergenerational transfer, transmission of inequality, we've done particularly bad, Leon. We, we have put a, the burden on a local public financed public education system, and we have increasing geographic segre economic segregation. And so you, if you're poor, you live in poor areas. You're rich, you live in rich areas. And the result of that is our education system helps propagate more before uh, market income inequality. Okay, uh, and they actually have uh, education systems that are more have more equality of opportunity. And you see that particularly at the secondary, at the, at the tertiary, at the university level, no country has a system of student debt or I shouldn't say no country, there probably is some, but very, none of the European countries, as far as I know, have a system of student debt like ours, uh, where the burden is placed. Uh, the UK has uh, income contingent loans that they make much more available. Uh, Scotland, I shouldn't say UK, England, one of the big divides between England and Scotland is, Scotland has gone for very much uh, keeping tuition low and accessible education for everybody which is a, a model I think is you know, very much focused on, on keeping quality of opportunity uh, open. And finally, um, Germany has wound up with a high level of market income inequality, but 
then they use much more aggressively than we do t taxes and transfers to create a more equal after-tax income uh, inequality. So in a sense, at every stage of the income gener inequality generation process, some of the same forces are at play but they've taken a, a much more active role in trying to, to mitigate some of the consequences uh, of, of, the, of these forces. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for this afternoon. Professor Stiglitz's book will be available for sale and he'll be available for signing them. Please join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.